Hello, my people. Good to see you again. This is Me Conversations. Me stands for Motivate, Educate and Engage. And, you know, today it's about conversations, talking about issues. And today I have a lovely lady with me. You'll be very, very happy to meet her. Her name is Agnes, and I'm just going to tell you a bit about her, but she's going to tell us more about herself. So just listen to this. Agnes is a mother of three and the founder and CEO of the Global Black Maternal Health Institute and has a mental health advocate in the UK and former head of engagement at a national charity. She has published articles and spoken extensively about the need for maternal health research in the United Kingdom. So that's just a snapshot of who we're going to be talking with today. And it's always and should be about intergenerational issues. It's very important because you can see my white hair, can't you? Doesn't mean that I'm that old, <laughs> so don't be cheeky. But it's about bridging the gap. It's about how do we work together? It's about what do we need to do so that we're speaking the same thing, we're doing the things that impact positively on the families and the communities we want to support. So today I have Agnes, so let's meet her. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on today. You're welcome. So can you tell us a bit more about yourself, Agnes? Wow. Um, I think you said most of it. <laughs> I'm a mum of three um, and I'm a social impact entrepreneur. Um, what does that mean? What does that look like? So I run three different organisations. That's the Global Black Maternal Health. That's the Glow Mama Awards and also the Fatherhood Awards. And everything we do is about society. It's about improving society and uplifting communities. Um, I've been doing this for about five years. Wow. In, 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 on, in and of itself. And yeah, I think that's me really. I don't want to say too much. <laughs> okay, so you said something about... Um... I think the biggest attractive, uh, attraction for me when you spoke about what you do is the Globe Mama Awards yep. because we're always talking about mental health. Could you say how that came about, especially with your yep. son? Yeah, yeah, great. So the Globe Mama Awards is an award that celebrates the achievements of mothers on social media. And it came about in the most craziest way. If somebody had told me, like, five years ago, because we're going into our fifth annual Glow Mama Awards, that I would be here doing this, I would have said, you're crazy. And the reason being was, you know, as a mother of three, I've always experienced kind of postnatal um, depression. Actually, I would say it's beyond postnatal, because even during pregnancy, I experienced, you know, mental health challenges, but I wasn't aware. And it wasn't something that we would speak about in the community and around friends. So I just didn't know what was happening, but I just knew that I was really, really, really down. And so what happened was during, um, I should say during the birth, around the time of my second child, I came up with this affirmation called Glow Mama. So every time I felt really down and I felt really low and I felt just at my lowest, lowest peaks, I would tell myself, glow mama, glow mama, keep glowing. Wow. And at that time, I didn't really believe too much in affirmations. I mean, you know, one day I'll be like affirmation, another day I forget about that. But I was at such a low stage in my life that I was like, I need to try anything and I need to be consistent. So glow mama came about. Subsequently, I gave birth to a, a third child. So now I'm from two to three and you know, during that time of pregnancy and having a new baby and getting up at two o'clock in the morning to feed the baby and not wanting the baby to wake up, I used to be on my phone a lot, just scrolling, scrolling. Yeah. And what happened was, whilst I was seeing all these different pages, I started to feel better about myself. I started to find out about podcasts. I started to, to find out about community groups and all these other different mothers some of them have got like 10 children and they're still baking. And I'm thinking, how, you know, I'm feeling so low. How are they doing it? At the time, I didn't realise it was digital peer support. That's what I've coined it now. I didn't realise. But on the back of that, I said I wanted to create a platform 
to celebrate all of the mothers who don't know Aww. that they're inspiring other mothers like me to keep on glowing. Wow. Um, and so I put out this page four weeks after the birth of my third child. And it was just meant to be a hobby. It was meant to be something that I could do when, you know, the baby's like, I'm holding the baby like this. And I know I cannot even put my foot like this. Like wow. I can't move. I could literally just you know, play with this platform and it's grown from strength to strength. And I'm so proud to say we're in our fifth year now. We're celebrating our fifth annual Glow Mama Awards. We've been featured in OK Magazine, in BBC, in literally all of the mainstream um, press. Our audience has grown exponentially and now we've been dubbed the bastards for mums on social media. So, yeah. It's so powerful and wonderful to hear such a story as this. And because we hear so much of negativity about yeah. social media and for, you know, and then it's bad, it's bad. But from what you said now, it's there's so much of positivity about it. And yeah. I think that is quite key. I'm talking to especially, you know, with moms in the community or parents in the community. But what would you have to say, especially if um, a parent has um, very little skills a lot, uh, around digital skills um, uh, going on. You know, they might be on WhatsApp, like we've joked about before, but what, what else can be done to support them? Well, there's so many things, because as I had um, said when I talked about the awards, I won't expect everyone to go out and create an award. In fact, had I had known the work that I would need to put in year on year, I would have shied away from it from the beginning. I, I fell into this accidentally, right? But... What happened was the platforms helped to signpost me to WhatsApp groups. So I'm part of so many WhatsApp groups now that have been founded by amazing mothers. Um, some are South London focused, some are UK focused, but the groups are really like my tribe, right? So what happened was, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, again, if now baby's not sleeping, you know, I can message in the group and be like, is anyone up? If, for example, you know, maybe my child, my son is having problems at school, I can message and get that peer to peer support, right? And so what I would say for anyone that is kind of lacking social media skills, I, again, didn't even have these skills when I started, so I completely understand, is try and find your tribe, you know, um, whether that be via WhatsApp, whether it's, if it's basic skills where people can maybe even check out the Glow Mama Awards and see who our finalists are. I know a lot of mothers actually check out Glow Mama specifically to find out, oh, who's in best community group? Let me go and follow them. And they know who to look for, if that makes sense. And, and they know how to create their space. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. There's, some, there's a lot you've said that's so packed and we need to unpack it bit by bit. But I think one of the challenges, again, is the lack of confidence for some of our families, especially if they've just come in, they're migrants, they just come into the country, they don't understand the system. What other things do you believe are challenges facing our community, especially as it surrounds their mental health, the issues they face as mothers? Because we've had this conversation off camera when we were talking about uh, being, you know, being born into the digital age and then some have not been born into the digital age. Yeah. What do you have to say about that? Well, there's a lot to say. So first of all, um, I, I didn't say, but my background as well, I used to work at a mental health um, hospital, particularly for mums and maternal mental health. And I used to oversee the rollout of perinatal peer support. So for those that don't know what perinatal peer support is, is really support for mothers who are experiencing mental health challenges. So I completely just want to give, a, give an idea to say that I really understand not only that, when I was working um, at the hospital, one of the things that blew me away, you know, even when I say it now, was the amount of people from African communities that are in the um, mother and baby units. It blew my mind. I was seeing, you know, as a Ghanaian, someone with Ghanaian heritage, our na we're named also on the days of the week. So when I was walking through and I would look and I would see the names of my name, that you know, I'm, I'm Abana, I'm Tuesday born, and I would see that name and I'd see so many. And the reason that it shocked me was not that we are more or less likely, but it's the fact that what I'm seeing in the hospital is not reflective of the conversations we have in the community. 
right? Um, and so I found a complete disparity in that. And I think what I would first of all say is community is everything. A lot of the times we're suffering in silence. So if, for example, you have a church group or, you know, you have a, a, you know, a community group or, you know, it doesn't matter your religion if you're, you're, if you're um, Islamic, if you're Christian, if you're atheist, but whatever community that you have, you, you're starting from there. But equally, there's the library, there's other places that have, you know, information and literature that literally will say, come and pop in. There's children's centres. Um, sometimes when we think of children's centres, we think, oh, it's just a place for, for the child. And we think it's just a place for the baby to go. But actually... And I'm just talking from my own lived experience. The children's centres have a plethora, let me not use that kind of English, have plenty of um, literature to be able to help to support you on finding your, your, your kind of tribe because and your community. Because my background is children's centres, so that's why so I understand where you're coming from. So you can listen to that, guys. Communities are very important. And I think one of the biggest challenges we have as a black community as well is that well, maybe the level of trust is not there, but I think it's something we need to keep on exploring and do. So I think it's, yeah. But I think, you know, let's be honest here. There is a lack of trust. And some of that lack of trust is legitimate. Mm -hmm. And I don't shy away from that. You know, there are reasons. There, there is sometimes a lack of under cultural understanding and awareness. Um, you know, I remember speaking to a lady and she was having mental health challenges. And she shut down, not from speaking to me, she was relaying her story. And she shut down from speaking to her, um, her therapist. Because when she started talking about spiritual attacks, and when she started talking about, you could see literally, like, the way, and she was like, oh, oh, you know, if I continue, the next minute I know, they're my children, they're going to section me, I'm going to take away my children. Um, and so, um, and for her, I mean, she was, I don't know, I, don't, I can't diagnose if she was okay or not okay, but she's thriving. You know, at the time I was speaking to her, she was thriving, but she wanted to be able to talk about how the role her religion also played within her mental health and being able to have a safe space to be able to talk through those, but that if a woman needs additional support, she can get it. And if she doesn't, she doesn't need that, but she's not penalised for coming into these spaces in her entirety, right? So I think it is important that we do acknowledge why there is a lack of trust. Mm -hmm. But equally, I think then there's also opportunities and spaces for people like myself, for people like yourself, who is doing amazing work in the community to be able to reach, um, you know, reach these, these muscles. Yes, it's, it's, it's an important thing that, it's an ongoing thing, it's an important thing, and... It's supposed to be a continuous thing. And that takes me to my next question. I want to thank you because we're talking about generations here, where I'm from, coming from, where you're coming from. We have, I'm going to ask two questions here. What are the issues between generations? Let's talk about that first, because we're talking about so much things that need to happen. How do we do that? What are the issues? Before we go, give us the solution about how we do that. What do you think are the challenges between the young generation and the older generation. The first guy, <laughs> my own opinion. Yeah. Okay, go on, go on. You start, yeah. Off. I think there's many. I think, first of all, before we even talk about intergenerational um, differences, we need to understand that for a lot of us, as in my age, no, I will not be saying the age, however you think I am. Say young. <laughs> young. I'm a, I'm a teenage mom of three, right? But for a lot of us, we are the first generation to give birth in the digital age, right? We don't have um, our mothers to kind of lean on to help to navigate. So our worldview of motherhood is completely different. Not, we need to hear that, yeah. It's completely different, not even just because of the intergenerational, but it's also because of the technology. So for me, for example, you know, when I was going through my own challenges, I turned to WhatsApp, I turned to Instagram, I turned to Facebook groups. In lieu of that, maybe 20 years ago, where would you turn to? Maybe your aunties, maybe your cousins, maybe your... So the way as mothers and as women we receive information is so different and that obviously then has an impact on 
how we are, you know. Um, so I think that's one part that there is a massive technological um, yeah. um, divide oh, yeah. um, and, and difference. And it's being bridged. You know, mom, I'm sorry, um, I have to now embarrass you, but you know, when I see the way my mom is on WhatsApp nowadays, <laughs> on YouTube, I'm always like, hey, PhD YouTuber, because the, the, the level of um, information she now has access to is phenomenal. Equally though, which is one of the challenges, the, um, I'm trying to find a nice way because I don't want to get beat. I'm not, I'm not too old to get beat for my mum, right? But um, equally, the ability to understand what is truth and what is fiction also misses is another part. So there's so much information um, and that understanding of actually, is this true? Is it not true? And, and, and so forth can also distort. Can so, it help? Can it not help? Can it help? Can it not? So I feel like in the, from the digital generational divide, there's a lot that we can be doing to A, and, um, assist our elders in navigating the digital aid, but also supporting them on being able to understand facts from fiction or to have that kind of critical lens to be able to say, actually, I've been sent this, that the world is ending on this day. And is it, because WhatsApp has said it, does, is it going to happen? You know, that kind of part. The intergenerational one is something that I'm really, really passionate about because I think, first of all, as a, as a black British Ghanaian, um, a lot of us who are first generation born here, we don't have the history of, um, I'm trying to find the right words here, but of, you know, the, the, the infrastructure to be able to build upon here, we don't have that. Yeah, and that's quite important because we see, um, I think we've had this conversation whereby you see a business, you see something start and it doesn't continue. Right, and that's the point. So we, we, don't, we don't have that. And, um, and then those that are maybe a, a, bit, a bit ahead, um, we don't have the kind of steady flow of knowledge, the transfer that is going through. So what we're seeing is a lot of people duplicating and repeating. Yeah. And I was at an event um, a couple of weeks ago. The United Nations was here in the, in the UK and I attended one of their events. And a lady stood up and she said, one of the problems we're having here in the UK, unlike America and, and so forth, is that if you look, most black organisations, they can never last more than 10 years, right? So that is literally a generation, when you think of that. Like, if you think of someone in their 20s, someone in their 30s, someone in their 40s. So somebody else will come up now who's younger, thinking that they're the ones that have invented bread now. Like, I think of my daughter, she's 10, and she'll come and say, oh, mum, do you know um, Stephen Hawkins? You know, you don't know. Or the other day, have you heard of Aretha Franklin? She's asking me. Exactly. Right? My daughter does the same thing. Does the same thing, right? You don't know this, but we know, yeah. But it's the same when we're looking at societal factors, especially with the black community, because we don't have systems and structures and legacy here, right, that is able to survive for more than 10 years. Those that now come and start, we often think we are starting and we have just begun, right? And so then we end up now taking so much time, making the same mistakes that our elders have made. And then by the time you know it, we're knee deep stuck and then we're having to reinvent ourselves again, right? But if we have this intergenerational um, listening and learning and even those that have tried and they weren't successful or they tried and they were successful like every single piece of knowledge is beneficial you know I want to listen to people that tried and it didn't go well I need to hear that I need to hear why it didn't go well even if it was in the 80s or the 90s because there is something there that can help me I also want to listen to those that are doing well, even if it's in a different field, but we need those conversations. So don't you think one of the challenges of the younger generation is about, we know it all, we don't need to, so, so that's a big issue, isn't it? I will say yes, but I will also add, because I want to stick up for my young people here, the reason that they will feel that we know it all is because there's not been a legacy. It's because of the problems that I was stating, like things end 
and then there's not a structure. Like, for example, if somebody wants to do um, a, a digital financial bank, and you can still do that now, there's technology and so forth, maybe they would have been able to go and speak to somebody who did a traditional bank, you know, who was maybe a black person in the, in, in, also in the country as well, so that they could learn about some of the challenges that they had starting a financial institution and the pitfalls. And even though it's not a digital bank and it's different problems, there's going to be history in there that will help you on the next, you know, iteration of that. The history. That's it. The legacy. The legacy. The mistakes. Right. And the, the successes. And the successes. So young people then come in yeah. and oftentimes, not always, can have a certain arrogance. Well, you didn't make it and now you're giving me advice. And, yeah. you know, um, X, Y and Z, not knowing that you're at the beginning of the mountain now. The mountain goes like this. So just like you're at the beginning of the mountain, so-and-so was also at the beginning of the mountain 20, 30 years ago, wow. right? And so um, it becomes, well, you're not successful. And a lot of people say that, you know, don't listen to the advice of those that haven't, are not where you want to be. And I do believe there is some truth in that. But equally, you know, you have to just be very discerning because there's so many people that have so much knowledge and insight. But if you only listened right, to even why they're not where they wanted to be. Maybe the blockages, maybe the attacks from work colleagues, maybe the stolen ideas that somebody went and stole their idea and cut them out. And you're looking at them and judging them for thinking, well, you, you're not as far as you should have been. But if you listen to them, you will prevent yourself from also being in the same pitfalls that they also went to. Fantastic. I think you've even answered all the questions because it was that... So what do we do to work mm -hmm. together? What do we do? So you said it's about listening. It's about le wanting to learn, wanting to listen, and then taking on board that. But what about the older generation? So it's both. It's both. And my elders, please, um, I'm doing soft, soft. With all humility. With all humility, I bow down. But I think also the elders. So you said something about, um, you know, the young people not wanting to listen. It's that, it's that perception. Right. And I think sometimes with the elders, it's about understanding that we don't have legacy here. So a lot of the time at the younger generation keep having to rebuild and then rebuild. So those that are in their 30s now, um, they're now becoming unstuck. And those that are now in their, their 25 or so forth are now feeling like, hey, we're the ones that have arrived. Those that are 15 are also coming. And later on, if the ones that are 25 or 35 have not really created structures, those 15 year olds will be 25 still thinking, oh God, I've arrived, right? Um, and I, so, I suppose, so it's really for the elder generation to understand what the, syst what the system is, right? And I think it's humility on both sides. It's young people being humble enough to always be a student, and I always say that the moment you think you are not a student anymore and you know it all, just know your destruction is around the corner, right? Thank you for saying that. Because one of the things we do in Parents Schools to Go is bringing young volunteers on board. So some of our uh, um, young people that have been part of our clubs are now volunteering and they can learn from the elders from that. Right. Like you said, it takes humility. It takes humility, right, to be a student. Um, but also, as I said, you always have to be a student. That means that even the elders, we still, have to we still have to be a student because you may have gone through life and have all the wisdom which we need to learn from, but you've never been through 2023. You've never been through raising children during the digital age. You've never been through the things or COVID, like the things that you also have to be aware of that you also don't know. Right. And I think when we all come into these spaces with humility and with an awareness that we are open to um, learning, hearing different opinions, we start from that standing point. We'll all get along a lot better. Thank you so much, Agnes. I think it's been wonderful. I want it's like we shouldn't stop actually. <laughs> I've been enjoying listening to you. Thank I, you. I think it's something that we need to do all the time so that 
we can impact our world. There's so much to do out there, but it's about bridging the gap so that we can do what we need to do and make the world see that we can do it and make our communities proud and bringing the good, the culturally sensitive issues that we need to focus on so that our young people too don't lose on that. They don't miss out on that. Exactly. You, you've said so much even off screen about how you've, you, you're still a Ghanaian at heart, really. Some of the cultural things you've learned from your dad and mom, you know, we want to keep on, we want to hold on to that. Exactly. We can. So thank you. Any last words? Do you, what do you want to tell the parents out there, the young and old, as a last word? Yeah. No, I just want to say to everybody that's listening, that you know what you can do it whatever it is that you're going through keep on glowing that's our mantra glow mama and glow dads as well we don't want to discriminate and you know we're here to support check us out check us out on our website www.globalblackmaternalhealth.org and then also www.glowmamaawards.com Thank you so much. And so that's us today with me conversations with Margaret Arimo. I think I want to believe that you've enjoyed it. Watch out for a next episode of Me Conversations and I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. Take care. God bless.